Uh, I'm very tempted to begin with uh, the very recent election, but uh, just before we do that, um, maybe we'll talk a little bit about life in Brooklyn and sort of uh, what uh, your experiences as, as activists, as very young people for the Jewish community, and um, how maybe the, how that shaped your your outlook and your political views. Oh, please. <laughs> well, I like to joke about Yossi and myself that we're both recovering Jewish fascists. Um, no, Brooklyn. In, uh, when we grew up in Brooklyn, it was uh, it was a, it was a remarkable place in the sense that the Jewish intensity of the place was extraordinary. We grew up among Holocaust survivors. Uh, in the years before the honorific Holocaust survivor became a status in, in the American Jewish community. Um, you know, for people like us, I've always said that before the Holocaust was a historical reference point or a moral reference point, it was a family reference point. I mean, it was really about what happened to our families before it was what happened to world history. Um, it was also the 1960s. There was an awful lot of student activist energy in the air, generally in this country. Um, there were uh, tensions between the Jews of Brooklyn and the Jews of Manhattan. Um, there were, uh, there was this, you know, the Holocaust, 1968 was not that long after. There was the 1967 war. I'm sure Yossi, like me, had the Super Jew poster somewhere. Um, there was the, so there was the, everything was kind of italicized and intensified and heightened about that Brooklyn, about that Brooklyn. Um, I, you know, from my, you know, from my sins, you know, et chata'ay ani maskir hayom, um, was drawn when I was 17 to Mayor Kahana, who actually came to my high school and appears, I'm afraid, in my high school yearbook, um. I was cured of that pretty quickly because shortly thereafter I made my first trip to Israel and discovered that Jewish force and Jewish vitality and Jewish pride and Jewish dignity didn't also have to be dark and twisted in that way. There was something about Israeli dignity and Israeli pride that was sunnier despite the situation that our brothers and sisters in Israel faced. And then when I got to college, uh, which was at Columbia. Uh, I quickly transferred my affections, as it were, to student struggle for Soviet Jewry, which is where I met Yossi, um, upstairs on the second floor on 72nd Street, in the back, where the mimeograph machines were with the purple ink. Uh, what were they called? Gestetners or something like that. Don't and worry, nobody knows what a mimeograph machine is. Yeah, exactly. And had experiences right outside this shul. I was reminiscing to Yossi before, I particularly remember one demonstration. Well, I read two things. One, there was a night that my parents swelled with pride because some local TV station actually captured me taunting the Soviet Union outside that building. It's not clear to me that anyone briefed Brezhnev on what I'd said, but it was... Um, and then there was this magical moment. We were There was a Soviet jury demonstration right outside here, and it was at that period where Triple SJ was having demonstrations, but the JDL were beginning to take things over and to move towards a more confrontational type of affair. And police were, we were surrounded by police, and they were on horses, and a little old Jewish lady came up to me and said, here, take this. And I looked at what she was giving me, and it was a hat pin. And I said, why would I need a hat pin? And she explained that she was from the Ladies Garment Workers Union, and their strategy had always been that the ladies wore hat pins to rallies because if the police came on horses, you could stab the horses and they would go away. And I said to her, Madam, you can keep the hat pin. There is absolutely no way on earth I'm going to stab a horse. Uh, but I have to say, those were those were actually glorious years. Triple S J. Yossi's written wonderfully about this. Um, it was, uh, they, were, they were glorious years because there was a feeling first that we could be effective, and in the long run, in some way, we were. I mean, there's a, some, when you, when you look at the full causal history of what happened with Soviet Jewry, that we played a, I mean, the organization we participated in played a role. And there was something, um, how shall I put it? it, it, it there wasn't anything morbid about it. In other words, it wasn't, 
it wasn't just it wasn't just Zachor and it wasn't just Gedenk and it was there was something that we felt we were felt we were doing we were we were historical actors, even though we were from Brooklyn. Um, and I think that feeling was very important. It's very important, and I, I think about young people. It's very important to feel that that you have the power to act historically. Uh, it's it's you know and it's it's something that can't be done by clicking a website or hitting send. In other words, it, 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 it's something else. And that was, I think, very important. I, I mentioned to Leon Gary when you were introducing us that this is the first time that I think in either of our resumes the JDL ever appeared. So uh, that may be the last. And so really, just to pick up where, where you left off, Leon, I, the Soviet Jewry movement was a, an experience of empowerment on two levels personally, certainly for for children of survivors and for Brooklyn, what old Brooklyn represented. And uh, the JDL was, was a, a gathering place of uh, working class Jews and children of survivors. That was really the meeting point of Jews who felt dis, disaffected, uh, unrepresented by the American Jewish community and the move to the suburbs. We were the Jews we felt who had been left behind. Uh, there was also a, a, a deep anger that I grew up with, and I, I would guess you did too, toward the American Jewish community of the, of the 1940s. The sense that, and it was very personal. When Leon spoke about, uh, we experienced the Shoah as a family, uh, as, as a fam family trauma. There was a sense of American Jewry having abandoned our families, and. The Soviet Jewry movement was really the transitional experience, as it turned out, not only for us, but really for American Jewry. It became the moment when the Jewish community uh, was transformed from that helpless, uh, and perhaps perhaps it was a, a self-inflicted powerlessness uh, the, of the 1940s into the Jewish community that, that we know today. Uh, it was the moment when when American Jewish political power came of age. And the fact that this was a rescue effort for the last major Jewish community left behind in Eastern Europe, in some way was very much a sense of, we had the sense of compensating for the failure of American Jewry in the 1940s. This was the great tikkun of our generation for American Jewry. And the, um, I think there was another dimension here, which is that it wasn't only the coming of age Jewishly for American Jewry, but to some extent also as Americans. I think that the fact that that American Jews were not embarrassed to be loud and abrasive in public for a Jewish cause, and certainly the 1960s uh, contributed to empowering uh, this sense of Jewish assertiveness, uh, as did the the Six Day War, there was a convergence of, um, of psychological events that, that, that empowered American Jewry, and we were the beneficiaries of that. And I'd say the, 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 the final piece here is that it was much easier growing up Jewishly when we did, because the, the justness of, of our cause was so self-evident. And we were able to look at the world in a black and white way and look at Jewish, Jewish uh, political reality in a black and white way before it began to get messy. And there was something exhilarating about growing up right after the Shoah, which itself was a, 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 the ultimate non-nuanced experience. The Shoah was, was entirely black and white. And we were able to filter that that, that experience in, in, a, in a counter fashion that was also absolute. And, and it was deeply satisfying emotionally. And I think about uh, young Jews growing up today and just how complicated Jewish life is, the dilemmas that we're facing, and, and how exhilarating it was to be 18 and know that history is on your side. I would just add one thing to that, which is that, I mean, Yossi's right, there was a kind of rage. 
there's no question about it. And and student politics of those years, even in America, was characterized by rage. But I also want to point out that there was a lot of joy and also the cultural richness of the Brooklyn that we grew up with was extraordinary. Um, there was orthodoxy, obviously, but of a very rich kind. There was Zionism. There was Yiddish. There was Hebrew. There were Hebraists in the Orthodox Day School that I went to. Um, and there was, you know, we studied modernist Hebrew poems. We, uh, we lived full Jewish and American lives. I mean, I see I have an old friend here uh, whose face I see in the audience with whom I remember. We once um, we went to a Jimi Hendrix concert together at Philharmonic Hall, and after the first show was over, hid in the men's room in the stalls and snuck into the second show in our yarmulkes. Um, so, you know, and there was this feeling that there was an enormous sense of possibility, an enormous sense, of, which I guess has been Brooklyn's traditional role, right? I mean, Brooklyn is one of those places that launches people, and it launched us. So I do want to get on to the election, um, still fresh in our minds. And um, that was so yesterday. That <laughs> was, was actually the day before yesterday. Um, so, you know, in a sort of parochial way, the, there's been a focus in, in, in some parts of the Jewish community about what percentage of the Jewish vote um, Obama and Romney got. And uh, this certainly was a major effort uh, in, in the Republican uh party and with a great deal of funding behind it to to make this a, 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 an issue to bring the Jewish community over. Um, it seems that Obama got about 69-70% of the Jewish vote, which is down from estimates of between 74 and 78%. I'm sorry, did I, did Obama got. He got about 69-70% to 70 of the Jewish vote last time he had, but the estimates are between 74 and 78 um, percent. What struck me recently is the polls in Israel, Israeli Jews um, in, a, in mock polls um, were three to one in favor of Romney, and Israeli Arabs were three to one in favor of Obama. So I guess I pose the question, what does it mean when American Jewish voting patterns are closer to Israeli Arabs than uh, to Israeli Jews. So start with you, Yossi. Okay. Well, on the on, on question of foreign policy, Israel is a red state. Now, it is not a red state on domestic issues. If Israelis uh, have been asked to to judge the merits of uh, Romney. Uh, versus Obama, I suspect that uh, the, the numbers, while not uh, equally the American Jewish uh, landslide, would nevertheless be far more balanced. So Israelis tend to look at the world primarily, or at least initially, through a foreign policy agenda. And the question there, I mean, if, if, if the question is why, why do Israelis regard Obama with such deep wariness? I think that, that for thoughtful Israelis, the question was, was never, does he love us or not? Is he our friend? And the, the argument that I've heard in, in the Jewish community in the last months uh, over, over Obama and Israel, to my mind, has really missed the point. And I also find it fascinating that after four years, we still have no idea of who Obama is. And, and that's true generally. And it's also true in terms of Israel. Is he a, um, the best friend that Israel has ever had, as we hear from, from some Jewish Democrats? Or is he a closet Muslim who, um, who is, is preparing to, to sell us out, as we hear from the other side? And my sense is that the question of Obama's friendship is irrelevant, first of all, because I, I don't know if Obama is anybody's friend. I think there's this, this myth of, of, uh, of Obama's nobility, which, frankly, I, I don't understand, but we'll leave that aside. The question that, to my mind, is much more relevant is whether Obama's policies generally, and not just in relation 
to, far, to aid to Israel, to military cooperation. Are his policies in the Middle East making us safer or more endangered? Now, the breaking point for many Israelis was, um, was not necessarily the Cairo speech, but what came a few months later when he turned his back on the demonstrators in Tehran. And what, from an Israeli perspective, what we see is a, a toning down of American power and a gradual retreat and, and the, the weakening of, of America's role as, as the sole superpower. And from an Israeli perspective, this president doesn't have it in him to project American power in a way that will keep the Middle East at a crucial moment of transition from turning into a, a, an uninhabitable region. And we're getting close to that, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood. And there seems to be a, a, either a, a confusion in policy or a lack of urgency, or perhaps even an understanding the full nature of the threat that, uh, that these la this last year or two uh, has, uh, has opened uh, to Israel. So yes, Obama's been very good in terms of the Iron Dome and protected and offering, offering Israel the means to defend ourselves, but he's also making it increasingly necessary for us to find the means to defend ourselves in a way that we haven't experienced before. And Israelis, frankly, don't trust Obama when he says he has our back, certainly not on Iran. Well, there's so much to be said about this. I think that I think that American Jews have always had this desperate need to believe that every president now sitting in the White House is, quote, the best friend Israel ever had, close quote. Um, we heard this about Reagan. We heard this about even Nixon. We heard this about Clinton. Uh, we didn't hear it about George H.W. Bush. Um, people try to persuade him. We don't need the president to be the best friend Israel ever had. Um, Obama is, as Yossi described, I think Yossi's right, I think his foreign policy has been in the Middle East certainly has been at best incoherent, at best incoherent. I think that um, he, uh, the fact that he came to the Middle East a few times and never visited Israel once is inexplicable. Um, the fact that he bungled the various moments in the Arab Spring, beginning, as Yossi said, in June 2009, uh, the demonstrations in Tehran were the single most, put aside the moral obligations of the United States to support democracy democratizers everywhere, but the demonstrations in Tehran in 2009 were the single most strategically important event since the demonstrations in Eastern Europe in 1988-1989. Uh, and there is no greater prize, there is no greater prize uh, strategically in the Middle East than the collapse of the Iranian regime and its replacement by an accountable democratic government. There is no greater strategic prize. And Obama bungled. Um, he is, I think Yossi is correct, he has a certain withdrawalist temperament, um, but again, he's incoherent because he has absolutely no inhibitions about using force against terrorists. Uh, the American drone campaign is relentless. Um, you know, there is the question, and we'll talk about Iran, sure, I'm sure, because that's what we have to talk about. Um, the ultimate question is whether or not he could ever order an attack against the Iranian facilities. There's also a question about whether or not it would be smart to order such attack, whether it would be effective. There are many questions to be asked. But I think that, uh, um, and I think frankly that I will say that uh, the um, that Netanyahu has not been especially helpful in this. Uh, you know, after Obama made the Cairo, you know, it, one of the comic aspects of Israeli politics is the way in record time it apes American politics. And no sooner had Obama made the Cairo speech than Netanyahu made the Bar Ilan speech and finally came out for two states. And, and I mean, I'm not going to go on about Netanyahu. It's, it's well known that I, I'm not a big admirer of his. But, but there, was, there was some internal, he began to play some political game in the United States where you felt that he was basically trying to wait, wait it out until the election. And at one point, actually, to see if he could turn American Jewry against Obama. Um, you know, I think that. Uh, I think that what we have to look forward to is is nervousness, is nervousness, um, because Obama is essentially opaque about these things, um, essentially opaque. 
uh, I think that the his policy. Well, well let's put it. This, let's start this way: the foreign policy disappeared from this campaign. Foreign policy was simply not an issue. Uh, partly because of the economic crisis, partly because Obama. There are many foreign policy issues he really doesn't want to deal with, and partly because Romney knows next to nothing. Uh, and it vanished. It vanished. Uh, so I think that Israel's right to be anxious. I think that um, that Obama's incoherence is not an excuse for Israel not to try to pursue some sort of arrangement with the Palestinians. I still think that the Palestinian question is an existential question for Israel, and it is not a great achievement of Netanyahu to have managed to make everybody forget about that question, um, because the facts on the ground are still the facts on the ground. I think we're going to have to live by our nerves. So. so if you were Prime Minister of Israel these days, um, and, and there's every reason to be convinced that peace talks uh, are, are not going to go anywhere anytime soon, uh, and you're also hearing that a vacuum in the Middle East is a very dangerous thing, and Palestinians aren't going away. That, the one-state solution kind of looms. Uh, what do you do at a time like this? Well, the, the one-state solution, remember, is not a solution. Uh, what's happening now, which is deeply troubling, is that people are losing faith in the possibility of the two-state solution, not as an ideological or political matter, but almost as an emotional matter. In other words, I mean, you know, it's been how many years since the 67 war? It's been 40, what is it, 47 years um, and I don't know how much longer we can go on calling this period provisional or temporary. And when you speak to, when I speak to Palestinians, when I speak to Israelis, when I read various things, it's clear to me that that existentially people are just sort of giving up on it. And I, I don't quite know what to do about this because I do believe that the two-state solution is the only solution, and that it's the original solution. It's the partition plan. I mean, that was that was the only that was to me was the only the only conceivable. But it's perfectly easy to understand why people are losing faith in it. Neither party, neither the Israelis nor the Palestinians, are lifting a finger to, to make it more plausible, each for their own reasons. None of those reasons um, terribly admirable, in my view. Um, I think that, um, you know, I remember when I, when I was a boy studying the history of Zionism, a young man, I remember I read, when I first read Ben-Gurion's reaction to when the, when the white paper was dead, Ben Gurion said something that has stayed with me my whole life. He said, "We will fight the white paper as if there is no Hitler, and we will fight Hitler as if there is no white paper." And the, and what he was saying there was that no state faces only one threat at any one time. In other words, there isn't just one threat or one problem, and a responsible and diplomatically imaginative government has has the task of moving against various threats or outcomes at the same time, at the same time. Um, and that is not what we're seeing right now. And it concerns me deeply because, uh, you know, this, this, it, con it concerns me deeply. I think it's important to understand the, the background to the paralysis in Israel. And, and there's no question state, I, I would define it as emotional paralysis, uh, even more than political. The political paralysis is, is an expression of the paralysis that most of us feel today in Israel on the Palestinian issue. And, and the paralysis is a result of the end of the 45-year debate between left and right. Uh, and I say the end of the debate, and we're going to see that, I believe, in expressed in this coming election in Israel, where the Palestinians are going to be a virtually non-issue. The Labor Party is making a comeback in this election based on its ability to transform itself from being the party of the Oslo process to a socioeconomic party. So that's an expression of, uh, of a certain sense of, I, 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 would, I would hesitate to say despair, but more of a sense of pragmatism on the part of Israelis, 
But I'd, I'd like to get back to the paralysis that many of us feel. And the paralysis is a result of having internalized the insights of both left and right in this 45-year debate. Most Israelis today are a little bit left and a little bit right. They're left-wing in the sense that they understand that the occupation is an existential threat long-term to, uh, to Israel for all the reasons that we all have heard over the years, demographic, moral, political, diplomatic. And at the same time, they're a little bit right-wing in, in their deep sense of, uh, of their deep wariness of uh, Jewish self-delusion, which, uh, which was in full flower in the 1990s, in the Oslo years. And most Israelis today would see a Palestinian state as both an existential necessity and an existential threat. And in that sense, the, the debate in Israel is not happening between two rival camps anymore. Yes, you still have the settlers who represent, with their supporters, perhaps 20, 25 percent of the public. That's a large minority, but don't forget that, that in the 70s and 80s, the settlers and their supporters were probably 60 plus percent of the public. And so on, on the other hand, most, uh, most Israelis who recognize a Palestinian state as an existential necessity also see it as an existential threat. And the paralysis that's reflected in, uh, in, the, in the political system, and it's not only Netanyahu, there's no real opposition to Netanyahu's uh, lack of initiative on, uh, on the Palestinian front, because most Israelis know it will not go anywhere. And the, I think that the, the single greatest loss for the Palestinians, and this, this is a result of the Second Intifada, was the, the end of the guilty Israeli. The guilty Israeli was the most important ally that the Palestinian movement had. And the guilty Israeli really created the Oslo process or the, the conditions that led to the Oslo process. And, um, and, and I speak as someone who used to be a guilty Israeli. I came out of the first Intifada very much a guilty Israeli. And the second intifada cured me of my, of my guilt. And I think that's true for, for virtually the entire Israeli public, with the exception of the Haaretz editorial board. So, so, so you know, Leon, when you talk about the lack of an, of an Israeli initiative, where I would agree with you in part is that what I, what I, would, what I wish Netanyahu would have done was extend the settlement freeze beyond the 10 months. So in that sense, I think that, that in an, an Israeli initiative needs to limit the damage. And by damage, I mean primarily psychological damage, the damage to Israel's standing, and also the damage in terms of what we project to the Palestinians with settlement building, because this reinforces their sense of powerlessness even though, in fact, the settlements actually constitute about 2% of the, of, of the land. That, that, of course, doesn't include the infrastructure, the, the, the roads and the army bases. But roads and army bases can be dismantled. We saw that in Gaza. We actually saw settlements being dismantled as well. But 2% of the territories are actually settlements. So that I... It's true that there, the settlements are scattered through the territories, which was their purpose, to interfere with, with the future contiguity of a Palestinian state. It's also true that the settlements that are most deeply embedded in the territories uh, will be the hardest to uproot because they're the most ideologically committed. Nevertheless, I think I don't see settlement building in practical terms as a real obstacle to a two-state solution. I see it as, as a serious obstacle psychologically, and again, in terms of the harm it's doing to, to Israel. Now, Netanyahu, to his credit, did impose a 10-month settlement freeze. The first leader in Israel to freeze settlement building across the map, including in settlement blocks. And at the time, he got virtually no credit for it from the international community. 
uh, Obama not only failed to embrace Netanyahu, this was the moment when he should have smothered him with a bear hug, but he provoked an artificial crisis. You'll remember the crisis with Biden's visit to Israel. This happened, I was recently reminded of this, this happened about five or six months into the settlement freeze. So you have a prime minister, a Likud prime minister, who is freezing settlement building across the board, and Obama picks a fight with him over building in a Jewish neighborhood in Ramat Shlomo in East Jerusalem, where any Israeli prime minister, whether it was Omerts or, 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 from, or from labor, would have built just the same. So when Netanyahu, too, and here I really have to defend Netanyahu on this, because he tried to extend the settlement freeze. He brought it to his cabinet, and there was, there was a revolt because of, of, uh, of, of Obama, who in a sense reinforced exactly what the Israeli right warned Netanyahu would happen. If you start to freeze settlements, you're going to end up pushing back on pressure over Jerusalem. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, I, I think that's a fine analysis. I would say that um, I would I would add or complicate it a little. I think that regardless of the American president's response to what an Israeli prime minister does, it is the primary task of the Israeli prime minister to make an independent assessment of Israel's security situation, security needs, and of its moral slash diplomatic position in the world. Um, and the paralysis that now exists shouldn't be used, and I'm not saying you're remotely used you're not, but people, there are forces in Israel that do use it to justify the continuation of policies that will foreclose even further the possibility of an eventual solution. Um, I mean, I've always regarded the settlements as the single greatest blunder in Israel's history. I see no strategic utility to the settlements except for those areas that we all know about. Uh, I'm perfectly happy with you know, the annexation of East Jerusalem. Uh, but I think that 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 the that the ten month freeze. I was glad that Netanyahu did it, but I have to say it seems to me to be in the, in in the long term an obvious strategic interest of Israel simply to be, to put an end to the settlement policy and to prepare not just the settlement pop the settler population but the Israeli population for an eventual solution that will involve the creation of a Palestinian state. My own view of Netanyahu's behavior. I mean, was a little bit more political, perhaps, than yours. I saw him playing to his base a lot and worrying about his own political fortunes. Uh, he doesn't strike me as an exceptionally brave leader in that regard. Uh, and I think that even though it's frozen, and even though there is Iran, and even though Obama is, uh, what shall we, cold, opaque, incoherent, uh, whatever, however you want to put it, I think that Israel's first duty is to see to its own long-term needs and its long-term integrity, both. And um, I would actually stop the settlement games once and for all, uh, because I don't see anything that is added by them, and Israel is facing spectacular threats of various kinds. Before you respond, I just want to add to the question, and then, and then we'll uh, move on. And that is uh, taking a look a little bit at, at the upcoming Israeli election, now that our election is over. Um, and it's January 22nd, it's very soon. So uh, maybe when you respond, you can talk a little bit about helping us understand. It seems to me that Netanyahu was going to win handily uh, anyway. And by partnering with uh, Victor Lieberman, um, who um, Besides facing uh, corruption, I was going to say his partner in crime, um, but I didn't want to mean it literally. Uh, it seems um, just mysterious why he would move so far to the right when he doesn't have to. So, if you can respond to that, well, Leon, I think that uh, you're half right when you say that the settlement movement was the single greatest blunder that Israel ever made. There were two. The other was the Oslo process, and and I, I see that I see the two as as almost inevitable expressions of two legitimate Jewish impulses that arose uh, as a result of 1967, 
And I think, I think in some sense we needed both of these movements. We needed the peace movement and we needed the settlement movement to be true to ourselves as a people. We needed to have one group of Jews who would try, after 1967, to, to at least test the possibility of returning to Judea and Samaria. And when you go back to 1967, because of the fact that if you, if you pray and long for, for those particular parts of the land of Israel, and when Jews in the past longed for the land of Israel, it was Hebron and, and Beit Lechem. And when suddenly that land fell, fell into, into our possession in, in the most just form of war that any nation could fight. The temptation, one could say perhaps a, 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 a temptation that we should have resisted, one could, but I think that there needed to, when one goes back to 1967, I've just finished writing a book about, which, which deals in part with the origins of the settlement movement, and the first settlement, the first settlement in September 1967, I know we're far away from, uh, we'll get from back. Lieberman and the election, yeah. But uh, the first settlement was uh, Kfar Etzion. And Kfar Etzion was founded by the children of the, of the founders who had been massacred in 1948 of this, this kibbutz. It was a kibbutz. And when you go back to, to those first months and you see the wall-to-wall -wall support that, that existed in Israel, time for the return of the orphans of Kfar Etzion. it has such a different resonance than what than, than what the word settlements ultimately became and you need to, to go back into the context of Israel and the Jewish people in the summer of 1967 having just been saved from genocidal threat that was certainly the mindset at the time and suddenly lands are open before us. And so I think we need it. In order to be true to ourselves, we needed to have one group of Jews who would test the possibility of return to Judea and Samaria. And at the same time, we needed to have another group of Jews who would place peace and justice at the top of their agenda. And I see these two movements as 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 inevitable expressions of the best of who we of who we are, at least initially. And I see the consequences, the political consequences of both these movements as having created the two worst disasters in our history. I mean I just wanted to continue to develop this a little more. I had firstly I think that the question of return has to be thought about very carefully. Obviously Every one of us, we go to Beit El, we remember that that's where Jacob dreamed his dream. It's impossible not. It's impossible not. But first, one of the reasons we're in this mess um, when we, is that both sides seem to need to return to exactly where they were before. My own view is that there is no law of Jewish history that says that Jews must always live wherever Jews have ever lived. Uh, and one of the things that so infuriates me about Palestinians when they discuss the refugee problem is that they just don't want a state. They want the same olive tree that their grandfather had. And if it's in Yafo, that it's in Yafo. And so I think that, that the, there is a kind of, the romance of return has to be, some intellectual pressure has to be put on it. Second thing is that Zionism accomplished what it did. It created the state essentially when it decided, well, first of all, to be a secular political leave aside the religious motivations and the mingling of religion and nationalism in the Jewish world, which I've always thought was toxic. But, um, but essentially when it decided, that when the Zionism of numbers triumphed over the Zionism of borders. In other words, there were Zionists who said that we want a state in the land, we want all the land, we know who those Zionists were. Those were the Zionists who rejected the partition plan. And then there were the Zionists who were the ones who established the state of Israel. Who established the state of Israel who, because Jews were in refugee camps and had just been massacred in the millions, decided 
that the size and the shape of the state that they accepted would matter less than the security that, that the establishment of a state would provide. And that what would matter would be that the Jews would always remain a majority. That's why I say the Zionism of numbers. And the settlement movement, to me, represented an attempt to, to, to kind of reverse that enormous, and not just not just historically important step. It was it was a, it was a it was a morally visionary moment when the leaders of the Jewish agency and the Zionist movement decided to make that compromise and make that consent, concession. And instead, the settlers began to treat 1948 as simply a, just an important step on the way to the restoration of Jewish sovereignty over the entire land. And this, I don't regard as having anything whatsoever to do with our better angels. I think it has more to do with our demons, actually. With our demons. I think that the, and that people who bring religion into nationalism and people who hold out for the whole thing are playing with fire. Are playing with fire. And insofar as the settlements represent the retraction of the original, the great Zionist founding move, as I've just described it, it's something that, well, it's not just something that I oppose, it's something that baffles me. But now well, we're... perhaps you can... <laughs> maybe maybe so. part of your response can help us in terms of misperceptions that you think American Jews have about what's going on in Israel and, and vice versa. Uh, Leon, uh, going back to, to old Brooklyn, I, I grew up in the Beitar movement. Uh, we had our headquarters in a basement in Bensonhurst at the time. And I wore for many years around my neck a, a map of the greatest land of Israel. Not just greater Israel, but greatest Israel. It would have included Iraq and, and the Euphrates, but it, it was just, as it, as it is, it was quite a heavy, that's, I, that's right. So uh, my, my coming of age as an Israeli was realizing that Mapai was right. Yeah. And, and they were right politically, they were right morally, and it was a, a emotionally a very difficult process for me to break with, with Beitar of the 30s and 40s. And, uh, and to realize that partition then and now was really the only, the only way for Israel to, to retain it's, it's, it's being. The, um, the question really about, about the settlement movement and, and about the right in Israel generally, and I think this in a, in a way ties in to, to your question about what American Jews don't understand, or perhaps what American Jews tend to forget about Israel, which is that the only withdrawal, territorial withdrawal, that has ever happened in Israel was when right-wing leaders pulled us out of first of Sinai and then of Gaza. And well, let's 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 wait for that for a moment. But to unpack this, I think that that it's only the right that can withdraw and ultimately will withdraw from Judea and Samaria because it's the right that recognizes that we are going to be giving up something that belongs to us. And the reason this is so important is because we're facing a national movement on the other side that emotionally, politically, psychologically has not given up a single olive tree in the, in the Galil and in the, in the Triangle and in Haifa and Jaffa. So that for the sake of symmetry, and, and not only political symmetry but moral symmetry, Partition needs to be based on a mutually imposed injustice. And that, and for me to give up Judea and Samaria is a trauma that I don't know if the Jewish people is going to recover from a self-inflicted withdrawal. I, d I think it will take us generations. I really do. I really do. And, and the mutual recrimination, the, 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 the trauma of of a self-imposed korban, and that will be the language that many Jews will use. Korban is the single most dreaded word in the Jewish vocabulary. Korban is destruction. And for us to impose destruction on ourselves will be a trauma that we may not recover from for generations. Now, I believe we need to 
impose that trauma on ourselves for all kinds of reasons. But the only way that trauma, that self-imposed trauma, will have integrity, Jewish integrity, is if we are giving up something that belongs to us. In the same way that we're demanding of the Palestinian national movement to give up what belongs to them. When I speak to Palestinians and they tell me, Jaffa and Haifa belongs to me, my response is, you're right. The problem is that Hebron and Beit, and Beit Lechem belong to me. And it's exactly the same way. And so what both sides need to do is contract our legitimate claim to the totality of this small piece of land that we both legitimately claim, and when I say legitimately, each of us can make a legitimate claim to the totality of this land based on our own narrative and our own, our own self-understanding. I think, firstly, you're right when you talk about leaders of the right, uh, but I think the important fact to note is that all the peacemakers in Israel's history, meaning Begin, Rabin, who on the Palestinian question was essentially a man of the right, he was not a dove until Oslo. You remember his behavior, I mean, the whole way from 47 through the Intifada, during Oslo too, so he was a man of the right, and Sharon, all of them underwent personal transformations of some kind. There was some human drama there. Uh, there was some human drama there. And so it's, you're right to say that people of the right are the people who will make the peace, but they will make it, but they won't make it without undergoing such a transformation. The second thing is that I think it's our job, yours and mine, and Jewish intellectuals, when we hear people saying that describing the free exercise of Israel's sovereignty for the purpose of compromise as Khurban, to point out that that is not Khurban, that that is demagoguery. Because what Jews mean by Khurban is the destruction of Jewish sovereignty or of Jews by other people, by other people. And, um, and I think that it's precisely that kind of, that, 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 that metaphor, but that mentality that we have to put some intellectual pressure on. Because if we, are to, if we are to concede to our brothers and sisters on the right in Israel and here that compromise would be Khurban, then we are setting up a cultural obstacle towards an eventual solution. And as you know, politics is hard, but culture is murder if you want to really. You, it's much harder to change. Um, so on the issue of Iran, which seems like a lose-lose proposition, um, any insights that um, that you want to share with us about uh, you have a, a president now who uh, is very much a president about uh, very cares very deeply about nuclear proliferation um, but also sees some say um, stopping Iran as critical to preventing nuclear arms all over the Middle East um, and does it just come down to whether Israel can trust anybody else to, uh, to do what needs to be done? Well, for, uh, for Israelis, the, the seminal moment that frames this question of trust was May 1967. And in May 1967, uh, the weeks leading up to the Six-Day War, Foreign Minister Abba Iben came to Washington and met with Lyndon Johnson, who was probably one of the best friends who Israel ever had uh, sitting in the White House, and reminded Johnson of an American commitment made by Eisenhower in 1957 when Israel withdrew from Sinai then. And what Eisenhower had promised was that if the Straits of Tehran are blocked again, the United States would lead an international effort to, to break the blockade with force if necessary. And Johnson expressed deep, genuine sympathy for Israel's dilemma, but explained that he was busy in Vietnam. And Abba Iban went away empty-handed. And the May 1967 moment is, is the lens through which Israeli leaders uh, are viewing Obama's promise to watch our back. And certainly, Israelis uh, trusted... But, but, but times have changed. I mean, the U.S. was not... Uh strong defender of Israel militarily and otherwise at that time. So I don't know if that's... Times have changed, but uh, in, some, in some ways there are disturbing parallels. 
uh, the United States is preoccupied with, uh, with, with a war right now. And uh, the, the question that, that if, if I were sitting in, in the government of Israel, I would ask myself, do I really think that this president, or perhaps any president, would be in a position, given the economic crisis here, given uh, the, the war weariness of the American public, to open a, another front? And, and then I think, in, in, in a way, Gary, the, the, the question, that it's, the issue is, what, what is your primary question about Iran? When I, when I, when I listen to the debate, about, uh, about, about an attack on Iran. The real question is, is what is your question? Is your, que is, is your greatest fear the day after Iran goes nuclear, or is your greatest fear the day after Israel launches an attack on Iran? And that is, if, if, depending how you frame that question, is really the, 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 the way in which you'll, you'll end up responding. And my sense is that Netanyahu, where Netanyahu has lost in terms of the Israeli public, is that he hasn't managed to, to focus the domestic debate on the day after a nuclear Iran, and instead the debate has shifted to the day after an Israeli attack. And the consequences of an Israeli attack on Iran will be horrific for the Israeli home front, for the world economy, for, frankly, for diaspora Jews. So the question then is, what is your greatest fear? I have a darker view of all this. I mean, just briefly, um, it's not, now let me preface this by saying that we all talk about Iran, but there may be only two or three people on the planet who actually know, A, what the Iranian situation is regarding their nuclear capabilities, and B, what the operationally what the war plans of Israel or the United States might be. So we're all speculating. I am not at all convinced that Israel has the capability to, to solve the Iranian nuclear problem militarily. It can retard it for a brief period, but with the consequences that Yossi adumbrated, which will not be pleasant. Um, nor am I convinced, and one hears that the United States, of course, does, but there are two things to be said about that. One, again, it could be that an American an attack also. We have bunker busters, so it's the morning after they'll dig deeper into another mound. Um, it's not clear to me that there is a military solution to this. Moreover, Israel is now in the really unprecedented and very unpleasant position of essentially asking the United States to consider going to war with Iran. Uh, this has never happened before. Israel's always, it's been a an axiom of Israeli security doctrine that it fights its own wars. Uh, and I'm, uh, you know, one can speculate about whether or not Obama would, would order such an attack, but I think the first thing we have to talk about in this is, is about the wisdom of any of these attacks. Now, um, I have to say, and I know this is heretical, but I do not see how in the long run Iran will be prevented permanently and forever I do not see how that would happen. I think the only real solution to the problem is, of course, a change of regime in Tehran. The problem there, of course, is that the democracy clock is ticking so much more slowly than the nuclear clock, insofar as we know how fast the nuclear clock is ticking. But it is, it is ticking. I mean, the, they're spinning. Something's going on. Um, so actually, I, I don't, I mean, you know, I'm useless on this subject sense that I don't see any satisfactory, I don't see any satisfactory solution to this. Um, and it's, uh, it, you know, it, it puts me in a marash chora. I mean, it's, it's one of those questions. I, I agree with you that the, the ultimate solution is the democratization of, of Iran, the fall of this regime. And it's interesting, Leon, that you, you speak about two clocks. The fact that there is a democracy clock at all that's ticking, means that that ultimately it's a question of buying time. And so if a strike will buy us time, then it needs to seriously be considered. The question then becomes how much time. And one hears 
within the Israeli security establishment, estimates ranging from one to two years to three to five years. If it's three to five years, the consensus I sense within the security community is it's well worth doing, precisely because of the democracy clock. One to two years will not give us uh, the, 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 the time that we really need for the, for the fall of the regime. On the other hand, there is the argument to be made that when Israel bombed the Iraqi reactor in 1981, the intelligence estimate was that we would set Saddam back by one to two years. And the decision was made nevertheless to bomb Iran, be, to bomb Iraq, because we, we know what will happen if we don't, and we don't know what will happen if we do. And the fact that, that, that we're in a similar situation today, we know what will happen if we don't bomb Iran. The sanctions will not stop Iran from going nuclear, as painful as they are, and as, as, as frankly impressive as the sanctions are, there's, that there's still not enough to stop Iran from going nuclear, and in the end, that's the only question that matters regarding sanctions. And so we're in a situation now where we know if there is no military strike, Iran will go nuclear. If there is a strike, Elohim Gadol. Okay, well, we have about... Um another 10 minutes or so. We'll take some uh, questions that uh, you might have, so please pass them up. Um, here's one says, what a pleasure to attend a Jewish event where the term Zionism is used in the first 10 minutes and in a positive way. Why does the American Jewish population seem to be uninvolved in the Zionist idea and some in American Jewish establishment actually seem hostile to Zionism? Um, I'm not sure about American Jewish establishment people being hostile to Zionism. That's a complicated question. I think there are, look, obviously, for all the generational factors we know, American Jewish feelings with identification about Israel are changing. Um, you know, Yossi and I, we're, we were not alive when the state of Israel was founded, but we were raised on the idea that it was not a natural fact of human history. That so... For us, the existence of Israel is a kind of miraculous fact. But for people younger than us, that is not going to be the case. We're living in a post-ideological period in which Zionism is not the only ism that has been, been cast overboard. Um, I think that the, the Israeli government has done things that have alienated some Jews, some of which perhaps it had to do because its first order of business is not to make friends with American Jews popular with us, but to do what it thinks it has to do, but some of which might have been avoided. Um, I think that most American Jews, like most Americans, no longer know the first principles of what they believe. In other words, I think if you asked a, your average American Jew for his views on Israel, he could tell you why he thinks that Netanyahu's right and Obama's wrong, or Obama's right and Netanyahu's wrong. What he couldn't tell you is why there arose an ideology called Zionism which then led to the creation of a sovereign Jewish state called Israel, what the philosophical reasons were, what the historical reasons were, what the moral reasons were. American Jews have forgotten many of the foundations of their identity, many of the foundations of their identity. They're overwhelmingly involved in the, in the behavioral aspects of them, in the pragmatic aspects of them, in the practice of things. American Jews have forgotten a lot of the answers, not just about Zionism, a lot of the answers. And I think it's 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 incumbent upon well, journalists, intellectuals, educators, whatever, to return the American Jewish understanding of Jewishness to first principles in some way. It's been a long time. It's been a very, very long time. The Second Intifada may have ended the period of the guilty Israeli, but the monolithic 70% Jewish voting bloc for Obama demonstrates that, that the period of the guilty American Jew, most of whom who have not and never will ever visit Israel, will never end. Is Israel, is Israel endangered by the guilty American Jew? Rather than, than directly 
answer that question. I'd, I'd like to say something uh, about being an Israeli coming to America in these last years, and, and as your your rift has been widening between blue and red, and that is also, of course, reflected in the Jewish community. Uh, what I find as an Israeli, and this will have bearing on, on the question, I think, is that I feel comfortable as a Jew in liberal America, in blue state America, and I feel comfortable as an Israeli in red state America. In other words, as a Jew, blue state America has embraced me culturally. And blue state America has provided a, a, the, the ground for the most extraordinary meeting between American Jews and the cultural elite of their host country in history. Uh, both Leon and I uh, are married to women who converted to Judaism. And that is an expression of, of blue state America's embrace of, uh, of, the, Jewish, of, of the Jewish experience. And, and, and I, I see it as a, as, a, uh, as a success story for Brooklyn. And so that's blue. So in, in blue state America, as a Jew, I feel embraced. As an Israeli, I feel most at home these days in red state America. My question really, and this, my question to American Jews, especially liberal American Jews, is whether their total alienation from red state America is going to undermine their ability to maintain deep connections to Israel, especially if this rift widens over the Middle East, and that worries me. It worries me deeply, and, and, and it's hard for me to fault liberal American Jews because they've been so deeply embraced in blue state America, but there really is a, a danger here in terms of our continued relationship. I think we have to put a little pressure on this idea of the guilty American Jew, and I think we shouldn't just analyze American Jewish political behavior or affiliation in psychological terms about status anxiety or paranoia or fear, I think that there is, American Jews are socially progressive. They always have been. They always have been. And there are reasons why American Jews believe in civil rights and civil liberties and meritocracy and gay marriage and, uh, you know, women's rights and, and, and immigration reform and progressivity and taxation and a fair economic policy um, this is nothing to feel guilty about. Um, there is a basis in philosophy and in political reality for, the, you know, the American, American Jewish support for Obama. And on these questions, I think American Jews have nothing to be ashamed of. Now, it's partly obviously because I share these views, but I think these views are defensible. I think these views are defensible. Um, so I, I, I think that, I, I, I think it's not, it, it's, it's not that simple. It's not that simple. Moreover, it is, I think that too many people have written off uh, too many American Jews on the question of Israel. I do not see all of the Jews of, of blue America being alienated from Israel. I don't think that's at all the case. They may be alienated in some way from Netanyahu. Um, all right, I, don't, I think that they, they give, they go, they send their kids. Um, if, God forbid, there was a crisis, we know exactly how they would behave. Um, and so I think we have to have a, just a kind of fuller analysis, a fuller analysis of this. Um, you know, the, 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 there has occurred within American liberalism, there occurred 30 years ago, and it's not recovered from this, a disjunction between the foreign policy and domestic policy. I mean, I've always had this problem, which I have never voted happily in a general election. Um, for me, it has always been a Tuesday morning with the lesser evil. Uh, and uh, when I, between the time I started to vote until the collapse of the Soviet Union, I voted entirely on foreign policy and national security grounds, partly as a Jew and a Zionist, because the Soviet Union was overwhelmingly the greatest power ever arrayed against the state of Israel, but also because the Soviet Union was America's rival and a threat. 
in the 10 years between the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the World Trade Center, I permitted myself to vote on domestic grounds, which is, of course, what a citizen in a democracy would like to be able to do, because, etc. After September 11th, I found myself voting again on national security and foreign policy grounds. And there has been, you know, so liberals like myself, we have no home. We have no home. And it's, can be, it can be quite excruciating. But that does not mean that, that I mean, well, certainly I'm not alienated from Israel, and everybody knows that, but other, but other, but other liberal Americans, it's not quite as grim. I'm going to ask you um, each for, for kind of a closing, some closing thoughts, and maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, which we, we hadn't really gotten a chance to talk to, um, is about the state of journalism um, and the future of journalism, whether it's written, whether it's online, uh, and perhaps um, some thoughts about uh, Jewish journalism, since we're here at a Jewish Week event. Uh, now, you asked earlier about what American Jews don't understand about Israel. And when I go around the country speaking to different kinds of Jewish audiences, uh, I find that I am in, in, in different kinds of time warps. When I speak to Orthodox communities, uh, it tends to be the 1970s and 80s, and it's still the time of greater Israel and settlement building, and the first intifada never happened, and there's no price to pay for occupation, and all we need to do is show resolve and we'll get through. And when I speak to liberal Jewish audiences, it's the 1990s and the second intifada hasn't happened. And all we need to do is find the precise formula that will resolve all of the outstanding grievances on both sides because we're always so close to an agreement and there's always just something that, that somehow gets in the way. And, and I find that much of the Jewish community or different parts of the Jewish community, let's say red state Jewish community, is in first intifada denial. And the first intifada was the moment when most of most Israelis came to realize that the left was right about the occupation. And liberal American Jews tend to be in second intifada denial and, and don't realize just what a, a, an historically shattering moment September 2000 was for Israel. It was not a blip on the way to a two-state agreement. It was a transformative moment for reasons I think many of you understand. So what I, what I look for in, in, in a partnership of conversation with American Jews is, is more nuance, is understanding that we're not arguing anymore, most of us, between peace now and the settlement movement. We've really gone beyond that debate, and we are now looking for any way out. And most Israelis today would, 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 would sign virtually any territorial concession if we believe that it would lead to some form of a reasonable peace. Uh, and at the same time, most Israelis know that no amount of territorial concessions at this phase of the conflict is going to bring us legitimacy and, and genuine recognition. So in terms of, uh, of Jewish journalism, what I, what I would say is, um, is that if, we're, if we were doing our job fully, we, we would be conveying this complexity. And my, frankly, my frustration as someone who has written from Israel, primarily for American Jewish audiences over the last 30 years, is that I feel that, that we're not somehow getting the message across that Israel has been deeply transformed, repeatedly transformed, and, and that I very much not just welcome American Jewish involvement in Israel's domestic affairs, including criticism, but I feel that American Jews have the responsibility to criticize Israel when, uh, when we deserve it. The question of who will ultimately decide Israel's security issues will be will be Israel's decision, and but this goes for the left as well as the right. You know, Teaneck was traumatized in the 1990s by Oslo, and then uh, the Upper West Side is traumatized now by by the Netanyahu government. But the question really is how do we how do we speak to both Teaneck and the Upper West Side, and explain that the divisions in Israel are not 
what they once were. And that to help American Jews overcome the obstacle of geographical distance, which is inexcusable in a time of, of globalization and in a time of, of, of sophisticated media. So really our responsibility as, as people who write and try to explain is to keep trying to convey complexity to help us overcome the, the often one-dimensional nature of Jewish conversation, where it, it, it appears often that, that Jews are able to hold one idea about Israel or perhaps other issues as well in their, in their heads at, at a time and to try to help make the transition to a community of multi-dimensional Jews. About journalism generally, look, journalism is in a state of crisis or transition, depending on how optimistic or pessimistic you want to be. Uh, if a Martian were to land in New York City tomorrow morning, he or she or it could be forgiven for inferring from what he sees that the bankers must have done something really good to this society because look at the way they're treated so respectfully but the writers and the journalists must have betrayed it cruelly because it um, there's no doubt that the crisis for newspapers is worrisome in an open society journalism is one of the fundamental institutions of a democracy uh, of a democracy um, the double whammy of the internet and the recession has hurt a lot of journalism America, um, the first period of the, the, you know the, the first period of the internet, the dizzy hysterical period is finally coming to an end. Um, it now appears that real journalism will be practiced online, and you know in the first period, it was you know it was journalism online was a mixture of fact checking and the sort of you know the self indulgence known as blogging, um, and. And I think now the old wine is being poured into the new bottles as well. And it may shake out. I, I, I don't know. In terms of Jewish journalism, I think Yossi makes an important observation when he observes that finally, finally, we have arrived at the point at which every, everyone agrees that Jews should say whatever they wish to say about any Jewish condition that concerns them, including Israel. And you will recall when we, we were coming up, you weren't allowed to criticize, and you were allowed to criticize. You could criticize in a language the Goyim couldn't understand, but Jews don't speak a language the Goyim can't understand. So, um, you know, and fine, that's over. That's over. And weirdly enough, it was shattered, actually, by the, by the public criticism of Oslo, by the Jewish right, who had been accusing the Jewish left of, 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 of stabbing the Jewish people in the back for criticizing the government of Israel from the left and then proceeded, etc. But anyway, fine. Finally, we're now free to speak, which is wonderful. Um, which is wonderful. I think the fundamental obligation of Jewish journalism is not uplift and is not edification. I think it's to report the truth about the Jewish community and to analyze it responsibly. And to analyze it responsibly. You know, we we're talking about this earlier. There is that that famous whatever famous, but there's that sentence in the Talmud: "Kabelata emet mi Misha Umro." Accept the truth from whoever says it. The fundamental journal journalistic value is truth. We can argue about how it's defined, and journalism schools have seminars about this and so on, but I think that, 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 that that's, that's our fundamental obligation. That, in, that, that means bringing the good news and bringing the bad news. Jewish journalism, until very recently, as you know, was all about the good news. It was all about the good news. Um, Jewish newspapers had to struggle um, to arrive at a point at which it was legitimate to discomfort the Jewish community with some bad news. But thank God we're there. Thank God we're there. Um, and that's a sign of our moral and cultural maturity. We're less insecure. We're less afraid. We're less not just afraid of the outside. We're also less afraid of ourselves. Um, it, it, it's a very positive development. It's a very positive development. But Jewish journalism will continue to require the support of the American Jewish community. And in and the supporters of Jewish journalism in the American Jewish community have got to understand that what they will be supporting is not their preferred narratives. It's not their, we've had that before. That goes nowhere. What they must agree to support is an empirical spirit, a fair-minded spirit, a fact-seeking spirit, and an analytical spirit about the all the realities in the Jewish community. And I think in that sense, 
Jewish journalism has significantly progressed. Significantly progressed. It's a much more sophisticated enterprise than it used to be in the old days when the, the Jewish newspapers were just kind of newsletters from local federations and and you know and we're happy every October to see that six Jews just won more six more Nobel prizes, that sort of thing. And in, you know we're 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 much we're a much more mature community for that, and Jewish journalism has played a very important. My uh, publisher in Baltimore, when I was with the Baltimore Jewish Times, um, Chuck Berger, who actually passed away uh, 16 years ago today, um, he used to say that if the Messiah um, ever came to Baltimore, the only way the community would know is if he sent in a press release. Um, so we, we have uh, gotten a little further along. And um, I just want to take this opportunity on behalf of all of us here uh, to thank you both for this wonderful conversation. But if the Messiah, wait, but if the Messiah, if the Messiah were to arrive, which you know we won't, but if he would, your obligation would be to have a headline that would read something like, man claiming to be Messiah arrived, right? That's, that's the journalistic mentality. Right. I, th I want to thank all of you for being here this evening and uh, wish you all a safe trip home.